Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Um, I came up with this, uh, or st I should say I stole this title um, from a recent movie because I feel like uh, these days sleep and circadian rhythms are everywhere um, all at once. And, uh, you know, the work that um, we do here at Northwestern kind of spans a lot of different areas. Um, so we've known for the last uh, 20 years or more that sleep and circadian rhythms are important for health. Um, and in fact, in 2015, the field of sleep uh, research came to the consensus that uh, we needed at least seven hours of sleep a night if you're an adult um, to maintain health. But we've yet to uh, come up with a consensus on what healthy circadian alignment looks like. So that's something for us to look forward to in the future. Um, we also know that uh, sleep is not just sleep duration, um, that other factors of sleep matter as well. Um, and things like sleep variability, the macro and micro architecture of sleep, sleep disorders, particularly sleep disorder breathing are important. And we know that some groups of people are at greater risk than others, uh, such as older adults, those with comorbid disease and during pregnancy. So today I'll talk to you about some of our recent work on sleep during pregnancy. Um, so why pregnancy? Well, adverse pregnancy outcomes can not only impact the mothers, health, but also um, impacts their health during pregnancy, but also their long term health risks. Um, it also impacts the long term health risks of the child, making it a particularly important time to look at sleep and sleep disturbance. And so um, we were lucky enough to be part of a study, a large study here in the US called the new mum to be study. Um, and we had an ancillary study um, to that project to look at sleep duration and sleep continuity um, during uh, pregnancy. So the second part of the talk um, will focus on another interest of our group, which is the um, impact of the timing of behavioral factors that impact health, such as exercise, eating, and light exposure. Um, so today I will talk on some of our work um, recently on the potential impact of light on health. So during this uh, series, I'm sure you've seen a similar slide like this um, several times, but just to kind of set the scene a little bit of what, what I'm interested in talking about today is that we know that the circadian rhythms are throughout the body um, and occur in all the major organs of the body, and that light is one of the primary time givers of the circadian system. But we have these other factors that can impact um, the system, such as social work, physical activity, um, and food intake. Um, and our research has kind of um, covered all of these areas, but today I'm gonna to focus on the impact of light. Um, and that we also know that these uh, things can impact um, peripheral clocks throughout the body as well. And um, today I focus primarily on uh, metabolic function. We also know that um, there is a, um, a relationship between the circadian um, timing system and sleep wake. Um, and this is just a little schematic kind of showing us that as the longer we're awake, the more sleepy we get, and that this is opposed by a circadian alerting signal that increases across the day um, to keep us awake as we, um, uh, as our sleep load uh, increases. Um, I, melatonin is also on here, and melatonin seems to be important as well. Um, uh, melatonin is suppressed by light. Melatonin is typically high at uh, night and low during the day. And we know that melatonin um, plays a role in um, metabolism as well. And so the timing of when we eat, for example, um, uh, if we eat when melatonin is high, that can have um, adverse um, effects. So I mentioned before, sleep is not just one thing. Sleep um, is, has many different factors. So the timing, the quality, the regularity of sleep, the duration of sleep, how sleep disorders impact the micro and macro infrastructure of sleep um, all play a part. And that we also know that poor sleep um, impacts a variety of different health functions. So it's altered energy balance, endothelial dysfunction, inflammation, um, and, and alterations in autonomic function. They also alter vascular and metabolic physiology, um, which can lead to an increase in cardiometabolic risk and disease. And just as um, this happens outside of pregnancy, 
Um, these factors also Im impact women during pregnancy and can lead to um, adverse pregnancy um, outcomes. So as I mentioned, we um, had the opportunity to work um, with uh, the cohort, the new mum to be study, which was looking at Nellie Paris women um, in pregnancy. Um, and this work was in collaboration with Phyllis D, uh, William Grobman and Fran Farker. Uh, Fran was here at Northwestern and now is in um, uh, Pennsylvania. And this was an R01 funded by the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute. So the new mum to be cohort um, was a cohort of approximately 10,000 women um, from eight clinical sites across the US. And there were four visits um, and outcomes were based on standard of care. Um, as this uh, sub study that we we're involved in recruited 901 eligible women in, in the second study visit, which was between 16 and 21 weeks, 22 weeks of gestation. Women had to be 18 with um, and, um, had no history of um, pre-gestational diabetes or pre-gestational hypertension, and these women were excluded. Um, and the adverse pregnancy outcome measures that we have examined um, are gestational diabetes, um, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, as well as pre germ birth, and um, hopefully soon a paper will come out on weight gain. Just to kind of orient you to this study, um, this study was conducted um, in, in 2010 to 2013. Um, there were three time points in which sleep was assessed. Um, and sleep was assessed in the first visit with um, a sleep survey, so questionnaires to all the women who participated. And we were interested in things like bedtime, wake time, how long it took to fall asleep, um, how long uh, during the, the sleep period where you awake, um, and how many hours in, uh, sleep do you usually get. In the second uh, visit, which was between 16 and 21 weeks, um, we had wrist activity monitoring and a sleep log. And this is an example of the watch that we used and a record um, from one of the participants in that study. And then again at uh, visit three at 22 to 29 weeks um, of um, pregnancy, uh, we assessed um, sleep again with the survey. The numbers um, here and here indicate another sub-study that actually occurred during um, this project, which was to look at sleep disorder breathing. And I'm not going to be talking about the findings from that study today. Although there's some great work out there if you're interested in reading it. So what did the sleep look like um, in these women? So um, I've used um, race and ethnicity here as just an example to sort of look at um, the different um, characteristics of sleep in this cohort. Um, and you can see from, from this graph here, uh, we have time in bed in green and in this sort of gray purple color we have sleep duration and you can see for the most part these women are actually sleeping or spending you know a decent amount of time in bed in the most in most cases um, you know eight and a half hours however they're not sleeping um, as long and just as a reminder the recommended amount of sleep for an adult is about seven hours and so uh, some of the groups are getting less than seven hours um, of sleep a night, some more. So why is that the case? They're spending a long time in bed, but not necessarily sleeping a long time. So when we look at wake after sleep onset, we can see that there is um, racial and ethnic differences in wake after sleep onset. And it's generally considered that th uh, 30 minutes of um, wake after sleep onset is um, too long. Um, and so all the women um, seem to be getting, or at least um, all the different groups of women, um, seem to be getting le uh, greater than um, 30 minutes of WASO. One of the other things that we were particularly interested in in this study was looking at sleep timing, um, in this case looking at sleep midpoint. Um, and there was a significant difference in um, sleep midpoint across the racial ethnic groups as well with um, non-Hispanic white women having the earliest sleep midpoint. So what did, how did we define sleep disturbance in this study? So we defined um, short sleep duration as a sleep duration of less than seven hours, 
Sleep continuity, we looked at wake after sleep onset of greater than 75th percentile and fragmentation index of greater than 70, 75th percentile. And then late sleep timing um, was defined as a sleep midpoint later than 5 a.m. 5 a. And on the right, you can see the graph of the distribution of sleep timing in this uh, sleep midpoint in this particular um, group of women. So one of the other things that we found is that um, not all women um, have uh, or experience sleep disturbance the same way. So when we look at uh, in this particular table um, of the demographic kind of factors um, in these women, that short sleep duration and late sleep timing um, are impacted by age differently. So there doesn't seem to be any significant effect of age on short sleep duration, but there does appear to be um, a relationship with late sleep timing. With in particular, um, younger women um, having more sleep, a uh, late sleep timing than um, women who are 22 years or older. Being poor um, or being below the poverty level doesn't seem to impact short sleep duration, but is associated with late sleep timing. And um, work schedule or appointment schedule appears to be important also for sleep timing, but not for sleep duration in these women. Um, and interestingly, in this particular cohort, um, there was a lot of unemployed women, um, and um, that also seemed to be um, impacting the late sleep timing with unemployed women um, sleeping later. So um, how was sleep duration um, associated with some of the outcomes of interest. So we were interested in gestational um, hypertension um, and preeclampsia. And what we found is that um, short sleep duration of less than seven hours was not associated with gestational hypertension, but was associated with gestational diabetes. And this remained um, significant after adjusting for various other factors. Um, in this particular model, we had to adjust for um, uh, factors individually, given the small number of women um, with gestational diabetes in this cohort. Um, in this cohort, about 4.2% of women um, had gestational diabetes, which is a little bit less than the general population or what has been um, reported previously, which is around 6%. So what about sleep timing? Um, so uh, when we look at sleep midpoint of later than 5 a.m., um, there was no association with gestational hypertension, but there was, again, with gestational diabetes. So this is the uh, data from the activity data in that second visit um, at uh, 16 to 21 weeks of pregnancy. So what happens when we look at the subjective sleep surveys in visit one and visit three of this study? So um, short sleep duration, again, um, seven hours um, or less, um, was not associated with um, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Um, in the first visit or in the third visit. So early in pregnancy or a little slightly later in pregnancy. When we look at short sleep duration and, and gestational diabetes, um, there is not an association in the first visit um, or the second visit with short sleep duration. However, when we look at sleep uh, mid, uh, midpoint, so sleeping after um, 5 a.m., for hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, there is no significant relationship um, with late sleep timing in the first or the third visit. When we look at gestational diabetes, um, there is a significant relationship with um, late sleep timing again in both the first visit and in the third visit. So we've shown here that um, sleep timing seems to be important. And one of the things that we also showed is that employment status um, uh, seems to impact um, sleep timing, not as much um, sleep duration. And um, uh, Danielle Wallace um, recently published a paper um, 
on shift work and adverse pregnancy outcomes. And this um, study was um, combined both the self-report data and the actigraphy data um, and looked at a subset of women who um, were employed. Um, and this subset of women was about 5,000. And the groups that she, um, she used were day work, evening work, which included night and afternoon shift and irregular and rotating workers. Um, and the outcomes of interest here were uh, preeclampsia, uh, preterm birth and gestational diabetes. And what um, she showed was that um, in the crude models, preeclampsia was associated with um, uh, shift work. However, um, after adjusting, uh, was no longer significant. There was no association with preterm birth, although in a study by Fran Farco, um, we have shown that late sleep timing is associated with preterm birth in the um, uh, sub study, oh, sorry, in the larger study as well. Um, and there was no association with gestational diabetes in the crude model, but after adjustment, there is significant association between um, shift work and particularly evening work um, and gestational diabetes. The primary outcome of Daniel's study was that there was a 75% increased odds of gestational diabetes in those who did evening shift work but there was no association with preeclampsia or preterm birth. And um, studies have varied on the findings here. Um, and it's, this is not the necessarily the first study that has shown associations between um, shift work or evening work and um, adverse pregnancy outcomes. The other interesting part about the, the study that um, Daniela did was that she did a mediation analysis um, on a subset of the um, women in this study who had risk activity monitoring and she was able to look at the variability in sleep timing and she did that by looking at the standard deviation of the midpoint of sleep. Um, and this subset of women included uh, 397 women and what she was able to show here is that um, the effects of gestational um, sorry the effects of evening shift work. Um, accounted for or um, about 25% of the association between evening work and GDM was mediated by variability in sleep timing. And so um, women who were day workers um, had a sleep variability of about 50 minutes and evening workers had a variability of about 90 minutes. Um, and um, so I think this is, is pretty interesting um, finding uh, in the study and, and is worth um, replication um, in a larger cohort of women. So to summarize the sleep and pregnancy section, objective and subjective late sleep timing are associated with gestational diabetes. Neither short sleep duration or late sleep midpoint were associated with um, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. And that greater variability in sleep timing mediates the relationship between evening work and gestational diabetes. And some important things to consider from this work um, is that sleep disturbance changes across pregnancy. And so we were able to look at pregnancy at various stages um, of pregnancy, but we use different techniques across that time. Um, we haven't looked really closely at um, how within women um, sleep changes in this particular cohort, um, but it's something that still can be done. Um, we've also shown that some women are at greater risk for sleep disturbance than others, um, and that sleep is a potentially modifi modifiable factor in pregnancy. And so um, I know that there's some work being done um, looking at how we might um, improve sleep, um, how we can modify some of these behaviors um, to improve sleep, but there's a lot more work in that area that needs to be done. So I'm going to switch um, topics a little bit. Um, and uh, the reason for that is um, that we have an interest in light and how light might be influencing health. Um, and uh, this work is unpublished um, right now, but is under review. Um, and it's work by Minji Kim, um, one of the faculty here, 
at Northwestern who um, looked also looked at new mum to be data from the risk activity uh, monitors, we were able to look at light levels. Um, and what she was able to show is that when we look at light um, in this panel here, we have light levels um, and uh, it's in relative to sleep onset. So zero being sleep onset for 24 hours and activity levels for 24 hours um, starting over here at sleep onset. Um, and what we were able to show is that um, light prior to bedtime seems to be associated with gestational um, diabetes. The light's important for metabolism potentially as well. So um, light exposure and sleep and health, while well, they're related as well, and this is just a little image of Chicago um, during the daytime. We get nice, nice sunny days sometimes. This is my office over here. Um, but the thing to point out here is that um, this is Chicago at nighttime. And like a lot of big cities, there's a lot of light um, that is still available um, at, uh, um, and it should be dark out. So why, why are we interested in light um, and, in, and the relationship with sleep? So um, when someone sort of sleeps at conventional times, you can see here, this is a wrist activity monitor a recording. Each row here is a day. Um, the yellow here is uh, light. The dark here is activity level. And in here we have a rest period or a sleep period. Um, and you can see that light is high when the person is not sleeping. It's low when they're sleeping generally. And this is kind of how we uh, anticipate that the light dark cycle should be. What happens when you don't sleep um, at conventional times? So this is an example of an individual with non 24 hour sleep wake disorder. Um, and this person is clearly getting light um, at both the day and the night at different days, um, depending on when you do the recording. This is an example of someone with delayed sleep wake phase disorder or a late sleeper. Um, yeah, midnight is here, so this person is awake um, at night, getting light exposure um, at night time, and then asleep during the day, still getting light exposure during the day, a little bit during their sleep period, um, but a lot less um, than they would have been if they were sleeping at conventional times. And this is a shift worker. Um, and so in this particular example, this is actually from the new mom to be uh, studying this, this particular example. This person is working at night, sleeping during the day, sleeping very short periods during the day, um, then has a day off, sleeps at night time, goes back to working at night, um, and then sleeping too short during the day and sleeping um, at night time again. So here, light dark expo exposure is um, all over the place. So sleep and sleep timing has a lot to do um, with influencing our light dark cycle. And we know that light is important both during the day and during the night um, uh, equally, I think, in some ways. So um, our work has done a lot, uh, our group has kind of done a lot of work on light historically. Um, early on, our work was really looking at um, the intensity and duration of light and how that may influence the circadian system and looking at phase response curves to light in older and younger adults. Um, but we're sort of um, more interested now in uh, the impact of light and sleep on health. And we've, as I said, we've examined it both during the day and during the night. So one of the earlier studies that we did um, kind of in this area was the looking at the relationship between light exposure and body mass index in healthy adults. And um, in collaboration with Giovanni Santastasi, um, we developed this measure called the mean light timing um, index. And um, in this figure uh, are two examples of light exposure patterns um, that with all the little dots being two minute bins of light data, the dark um, black bar being the mean, and um, each different color indicates a different day. 
And so you have two different patterns here across the 24 hour day. This person gets very little light, if any, um, at night. This person gets quite a bit more uh, light um, in the evening hours. And what we found in this study, which was really interesting, is that individuals that had an earlier mean light timing um, tended to be leaner than those who had a later mean light timing. Um, and these uh, timings are both during the daytime. Um, the calculation here is, is literally uh, with the threshold here of 500 is the average clock time of all of those points above 500. Um, so if you're early, you tend to be leaner. If you are uh, um, later in the day, you tend to be um, uh, not as lean. So why should we, um, why should this be the case? So um, we embarked on a study um, that was led by Ivy Chung, who's now Ivy Mason. So in a later study, Ivy shows up again. Um, this is work she did for her PhD. Um, and in this study, we're interested in looking at, well, why would we see this association between daytime light exposure and BMI? Um, and so we looked at uh, morning and evening brewer and lurch light and how it may impact um, metabolic function. And this was done in sort of normal weight, um, young adults. So in this study, we gave people three hours of morning or evening blue and rich light. Um, subjects came in for two different uh, two days um, and stayed in the lab, a group that got morning light and another group that got evening light. On the first day, um, they had blood sampled under dim light conditions um, and they were in dim light conditions the whole day, dark at night. Um, and on the second day, they had blood sampled again and they were given light exposure. And in the evening light, group, they had light exposure and a meal later in the day. The light exposure, the dim light was less than 20 lux, and the light exposure was um, two lights about two uh, feet away um, and in using this particular go light um, as well as normal room light, which was about 270 lux. What did we find? Well, when we first started this study, uh, we you know, I had uh, the thought that maybe light was altering hunger, um, but that didn't seem to be the case. So what this graph shows is um, a hunger composite score in the dim light with the dash line, the blue and rich light um, with the, dark, uh, the solid line here um, for morning light exposure. So there was an assessment um, before the light exposure, the light exposure started, participants were given a meal and then um, uh, hunger was measured um, every hour. Um, and we did the same thing in the evening, um, uh, but obviously a later time since wake, uh, and again, no difference in hunger, which was surprising to us. There was also no change in cortisol or ghrelin or leptin in this study. So what did we find? Well, we did find changes um, in the HOMA, both in the morning and in the evening. So this is from the sample that was 30 minutes um, before the meal was given. And so you can see that when you look at insulin levels in the morning, that um, again, we have insulin levels here, we have time since wake here. There's a sample that is before the light um, and before the meal, a sample before the meal, but during the light, and then um, a response to that meal that was given. And you can see that in the blue enriched light group, insulin is much higher um, than in the dim light, um, on the dim light day, both in the morning and in the evening. And another thing to note is that insulin levels are generally higher um, in the evening than in the morning. Um, and even with that, um, the blue and rich light increased light even uh, increased um, insulin levels even more. Um, so that's light during the daytime. So light during the daytime seems to impact um, metabolism. It seems to be associated with body weight, um, but light at night is also important. 
And so light at night um, can come from, from different, lots of different sources. And there's um, been several uh, cross-sectional studies that have shown that light at night is associated with obesity. Um, and there's a lot of reasons that you can have light at night um, or during sleep. So you can have a leave a light on in the room, have a bedside light, you've left the TV on. There can be light pollution from outside. As I showed you that picture of Chicago at nighttime, it's, there's a lot of light. Um, you could be sleeping partially during the daytime. So there's a lot more light from outside. Um, or you could be getting light because you turn the light on if you woke up to use the restroom or if you woke up and you got a call or something like that. So there's a lot of reasons that you can get light um, and it can be constant, it can be periodic. Um, and so um, some of the work that we've been interested in looking at recently is um, how light at night might be impacting uh, metabolism and health. So Dr. Kim recently published um, a paper um, looking at light at night in an older community dwelling um, group of adults. And this study was part of the Chicago Healthy Aging Study, which was a community-based study of older adults between the ages of um, 63 and 84 years of age. And um, these uh, folks were studied um, with wristectigraphy. Um, and a subset of those um, people uh, had um, activity monitors with light. Um, this is an older model um, uh, with the AWL. Um, and what Minji did was divide the sample into those who had no light um, and those with any light during the lowest five hours of light across the 24 hours. So during the L5, did they have no light or any light? She also did a sub-analysis to look at um, uh, if, if you had any light, if you had low or slightly higher, um, that didn't seem to um, impact these associations. And then we were interested in looking at whether light during sleep, or which we think is during sleep, is the lowest five hours of, um, um, of light during the day, oh, sorry, at nighttime, um, and its impact on um, health outcomes. And so what she showed is that people who had no light at night um, were less, less of them were obese, less of them had diabetes, and less of them had hypertension. And that um, people who had light at night, um, the odds ratio was 1.8, for diabetes, it was 2.0, and for hypertension, 1.74. This was um, significant after um, adjusting for the age, uh, sex, race, and the season um, that the actigraphy was recorded. And it also remained significant after adjusting for sleep duration, sleep timing, and activity level. And so others have shown similar findings um, in cross-sectional studies. Um, in, in community dwelling um, adults. So that light at night um, and light exposure at night seems to be important for health as well. So why might that be the case? So uh, recently, um, uh, our group published a paper. Um, the paper was led by Ivy Mason and Daniela Grimaldi. Um, and we're interested in looking at light exposure during sleep um, and cardiometabolic function. In this study, um, the participants came in for multiple days and they had blood sampled throughout the study. Um, they had a night in dim, uh, sorry, in dark light. Um, they were kept in room light throughout the day. And then on the second night, um, participants were either um, slept in the dark or they slept with the room light on. And room light in this case was approximately 100 lux. Um, during sleep, it was less than three lux. And during the uh, wake period, it was about 240 lux. And in the morning, after sleeping in the dim light or sleeping in the room light, they had an oral glucose tolerance test. And what we found was that uh, this graph here shows um, the room light in the room light condition, glucose and insulin. 
um, with day one where they're sleeping in the dim light as the solid bar um, and the dashed bar um, is when they're sleeping with the room lights on is that there's a significant increase in insulin that we don't see in those who are sleeping um, in the dim light on both nights. So in the morning, um, when we look at the fasting sample, we see that there is um, an increase in the um, HOMA, IR, um, after sleeping with the lights on um, at night um, compared to uh, dim light that's not present in the um, group who slept dim light on both nights. And that this is also seen um, in the early phase insulin area under the curve. So in the first 30 minutes, we see greater insulin secretion as I showed you in the other graph. Um, and we also show there's a lowered MATS unit index, um, which is an index of whole body insulin sensitivity um, after sleeping with the lights on at night. And this effect doesn't seem to be related to suppression of melatonin. So um, in this graph here, you can see um, in the room light um, condition where the lights are on in both day one and day two um, in red and the dim light condition in black, um, that there was no significant differences um, between the first and second night in melatonin levels. When you look at um, melatonin area under the curve, um, you can also see this pattern. We did show, though, is that there seemed to be an association between the LFHF um, during sleep and that um, change in insulin area under the curve in the first 30 minutes. Um, and that this um, change in LFHF indicates a shift to sympathetic drive over um, vagal. And that this relationship was not seen um, in the um, folks who were sleeping in dim light. So um, light exposure and health. And so light seems to be a significant con contributor to health. So uh, light exposure during the day and night are both important for metabolism, it seems. Um, although there's still some questions to be answered that are related to daytime light. Would we have seen the same effect on metabolism during the day under normal room light conditions? As I mentioned, we kept people under 20 lux of light. And would this be, uh, would this response be similar if we repeated over several days? Um, Ken Wright did a study um, where they kept people in, um, in uh, room light um, and did not find a similar effect um, to what we showed. Um, so some studies have shown improvements as well in metabolic function in those who are overweight with morning light exposure. So is it that we looked at healthy young people um, and that we didn't see a positive influence on metabolism? Um, that has been seen in some intervention studies. And then the other thing I think is that um, we, how much light at night is too much and how do you balance safety? So the risk of falls, um, particularly in older adults, um, when you're avoiding light at night. So in our um, uh, population study, we showed that any light at night seemed to be detrimental. Um, and in our lab-based study, that just sleeping with the room light on, light on around 100 lux seemed to be um, uh, detrimental as well. So I think there's some work to be done there. Uh, So what are the take home messages from today? Um, well, one is that I think that sleep and the circadian rhythms matter. So they're, they're important for health. So sleep during pregnancy is an important modifiable factor for adverse pregnancy outcomes um, and the potential benefits to the mother and child by optimizing sleep and circadian rhythms are, are great. And that um, the main message is, is that these nine months matter. I think there has been um, some thoughts that while sleep is you know, problematic in pregnancy, um, it's just a temporary thing um, and we don't really need to worry about it. But I think some of the work that um, we've shown and others is that sleep is important um, during pregnancy and perhaps circadian alignment. And I know that there's groups um, that are doing intervention studies that there's um, people trying to understand 
the relationship between glucose metabolism um, and sleep um, as well in studies that uh, I'm starting up. Another thing that I want you to take home from today is that when we get light matters, um, optimizing light exposure across 24 hours can be complicated due to a lot of different reasons. Um, is it acute effects of light that you know, light increases um, uh, alertness, uh, it can phase shift, suppress melatonin. Um, and so optimizing light exposure for, um, for folks may be um, complicated to, to figure out. Although in general terms, what I like to say is that getting light during the day is good and getting, not getting light at night um, is good. So dark at night, light during the day. Um, and that um, it also gets complicated by the fact that there's individual variation in light sensitivity. Um, and there's some great work being done in this area by various groups um, that I think will really help us um, understand some of these things a little bit better. Um, and I think the good news is for our field and for, for us as researchers is that we still have a lot to learn. Um, and um, I look forward to um, seeing all the work that folks do and also continuing to do this work ourselves. I'd like to thank uh, collaborators and our funding sources. Um, uh, key collaborators here are Phyllis C, Daniela Grimaldi, Ivy Mason, Dr. Minji Kim, Giovanni Santastasi, Fran Farco, and Danielle Wallace, as well as uh, many other folks here at Northwestern and um, at other, um, other groups. Um, and again, all of our funding over the years for these various projects. Thank you, and I'm um, open up for questions.